Welcome to the Invincible Innovation Show, the podcast for changemakers. Each week, I talk to the most fascinating entrepreneurs and innovation leaders about innovation, strategy, and design. Hi, everyone. The question today is, who will help a struggling company in crisis? Will it be a top consultancy with their experienced advisor, or should we use the power of open innovation? Welcome to Invincible Innovation Live, a show about people, innovation, and tech. I'm Adima Zolkalio, innovation and value creation expert, and I'll be your host. And today with me is Victor Hayes, innovation, Hi. 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 innovation and manager, innovation manager in Health Valley. Great yeah. to see you, Victor. Yeah, nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Thank you for being with me and it's going to be like very exciting because I think that the question is totally related to what you've been doing in your career so you have it both sides so you could help mm-hmm. us with it so from you. your from your experience you started uh, as a con- in topical fantasy called atos mm-hmm. and today you are working with open innovation so what would you say is the advantage of working with an advisor or a consultant which is a very top brand and And maybe trying the opposite side of open innovation yeah um, that's an inter- it's an interesting um, uh, yeah it's, it, it's interesting the, the the difference between the two um, if I look back it's it's been like 10 15 years that I worked for for Atos and KPMG um, and what what strikes me the most what I remember the most of it is that it's um, It's the tool set that they have they, they they put everything in building a tool set and building on a theory of, of innovation and and how they um, would like to help their clients and their customers so we did as consultants we were actually always um, educated either by our colleagues themselves or we were in training camps so there was a lot of emphasis on being educated and learning the tool set and learning the the way that Atos and KPMG were working um, with innovation um, and when I when I left that uh, company and I um, started working in hospitals and and later on in this innovation agency Health Valley there was a large gap on what I was used to in KPMG and I How it was working in in hospitals and 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 now in health valley and the the main difference was that well maybe even the lack of a tool set there was no common ground of where the project was going or where the what what the what the tool set was or what the, what the method was so I struggled quite a bit on okay how do I get that new project in line in a hospital and how do I start working with the tool set that I remember in a new way of working and how do they work here what what is what right. is the tool set that they try to use so um, and 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 that, that that gap from from the hospital to the innovation agency and the cluster where I'm working now um, again is different because now I I'm, I'm not so much more in one organization but I'm dealing with a lot of organizations and and Mm-hmm. to give some um, some background on what a cluster is yeah um, maybe not everybody's is familiar with the term but a cluster or a cluster organization is um, more or less a triangle of entrepreneurs of government and education in a specific area and for us in health Valley it's it's based on healthcare and healthcare innovation but you also have clusters for instance in Norway on seafood or you have energy clusters or you have um, artificial intelligence clusters so there's always a specific theme behind it and the triangle and our organization health Valley is trying to help that triangle bring on new innovation from 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 the academia into startups and scale-ups and try to work on the economic agenda for that specific region and um, So I'm dealing much more with with various tool sets and various languages on innovation from the different uh, uh, actors in the in the field so that makes it um, yeah it makes it interesting to see yeah. if we can so, connect everybody yeah it, for me it looks like two sides of, of the story one is like top down and the other as is bottom up 
And the top down is like from the management going down in the organization mm -hmm. and bottom up is from academy, from open innovation within the, the, the company or from the outside or from startups and yeah. creating something from there. Yeah. And, and, and there are advantages to each side. So like if, if a struggling company would have like a question, where should we go to find the answers? Should we take like a big company, someone with lots of experience and tool sets and, and, you know, the knowledge, or should we try to take it from the startups, from, from former uh, inner uh, powers, or, or what should they do? Yeah, well, um, again, it's a good question, because um, mm -hmm. when I was working with Atos, um, they also had, like, uh, the top 25 of big corporates in the Netherlands. So I did projects with Philips and with AXO and, and Shell. And I think for... In a way, and, and we're talking about 25 years ago, I think then maybe also innovation or, or doing these projects was also more or less based on buying a specific solution or buying a specific way of thinking. And yeah. KPMG, it was their product of doing projects and doing innovation. Then you would buy the KPMG way, like, just like you would go uh, with Ernst & Young or you would go to Deloitte. They had specific sets and sometimes something would trigger you in being a customer through another route, but you would um, buy that solution. Um, and it had, it does have some advantages because you know they have tried it in other areas. Yeah. You know that they have been working on it for a very long sure. time. So it, it, to a certain extent, you, 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 you buy um, a solution and you, you can also expect some sort of a result. Right. And, um, in, in startups and in scale-ups and in the innovation area that I'm working now, um, you, you're not always sure what kind of solution you're actually looking for. So right. um, the innovation and, and, and the, the way of thinking is, is much more built on, okay, we're looking at the specific problem. We have a challenge or we have a, a possible area of, of where things are not running smoothly and how are we looking for a solution? Um, and this is then much more of the creative side of, of design thinking right. and, and these visual tool sets come into play sure. where, where, where you bring people together around a specific um, challenge and ask them from their different areas, okay, how do you perceive this problem and what can you bring with your experience and can we mutually find some sort of a solution in yeah, I think that what you're what you're saying about finding a solution together is something which is more like the new way of management. Like management in the big, in like ten or fifteen years ago was more hierarchical, and many uh, companies are still that way. And if they want to innovate better, they need to maybe flatten it in a sense, and then mm -hmm. create uh, some some kind of innovation which is within the company. Or if it's hard for them, or they want another another point of view, they need to take it from the outside. And, and yeah. outside could be academia, it could be startups. And, and then they try to do it because in big, big organizations, it's so hard to innovate. And yeah, true. Um, it, it's true. a really, it's, it's a big challenge. So sometimes yeah. trying new way of thinking could, could really help. But you, yeah. you mentioned like health, which mm -hmm. is, a, there was a report from McKinsey, I think a month ago, and they said that the only industry that is still full-fledged fledged, uh, innovating is in, is in health, in pharmaceuticals. Uh, and all the other uh, industries are like go, getting, decreasing the innovation and, and going back to their core services and core uh, products. Yeah, so it, it's a good time for health, I guess. Yeah, it's an interesting, yeah, it's an interesting discussion. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if, if if healthcare is the only, still the only uh, industry that's innovating. I think also a lot of interesting stuff happens in fintech, uh, for instance. Yeah? Uh, but No, um, I'm, I mean, right now in the COVID crisis, the COVID oh, crisis for sure. changed, changed the, the powers of, of it the changed, market. It changed a lot in healthcare, yeah, for sure. Um, um, what what we've seen here in, in the Netherlands and, and from my experience of, of working in hospitals for, for 10, 10 to 12 years is that um, all of a sudden stuff was um, possible. 
and, and specifically using new types of technology. Um, not really new, but new for, for healthcare or healthcare for industry. Health. Um, it, it, it became possible to, to work more on a remote area or work with more uh, remote solutions, for instance. Uh, the technology of, of uh, video conferencing had been there for, for, sure. for decades, of course, um, and was actually one of my first projects when I started in hospital was working on a specific uh, video conferencing solution. But it was still um, too much the system that a patient would make an appointment and he would go to the doctor and drive to the hospital and park his car and get all stressed finding a parking space and then run up to uh, to, uh, yeah. to the doctor's office and and, yeah. and talk to the doctor on what was happening. And now all of a sudden um, we were doing video chats with uh, with doctors and we were um, so the crisis made stuff possible um, that. For some reason, was not possible earlier on. So that was interesting. Yeah, yeah, there is a big gap that could have been like filled like years ago, and and only now it happens. And sometimes people need a like crisis or a big change to do things that they are yeah are not willing yeah. to do before that. I guess. So under what, pressure, what, everything becomes liquid. We say in the, in the age, so. yeah, right. Yeah. So, what would you imagine would be the challenges that innovation leaders face right now in these days of of crisis? What will be their most troubling uh, problem? Um, well, I do think that innovation also thrives by bringing people together and and what we've experienced in health valley itself it's it's really an organization of of bringing people together and in the chance meeting of of combining these these uh, um, uh, people from different areas sometimes there that's where the spark for the innovation starts and when you cannot do that when you cannot have these live events when you cannot have matchmaking evenings or when you cannot have a workshop a physical workshop on right on on building um some change solution for for instance a, a chain of palliative care um you cannot bring the people and the ideas together that makes it difficult so how can you um we see a lot of digitalization now for uh, we're we're doing the online events we're doing the webinars we're doing even digital workshops on 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 uh, on on, um, on on the board of myro uh, for instance so you have this digital yeah. workspace um but um yeah that's that's the challenge because the, the um you need yeah sometimes you do need to have the people together so uh, right yeah. right there's only so much you can yeah. do on a digital sense but right yeah, that's really a challenge. yeah i agree i think that some people are more aware of the fact that there is some kind of an energy that happens between people mm -hmm. like they get enthusiastic to, together and they get new ideas when they're there, they're there together and it's harder to do online mm -hmm. um, and in general you know workforce change is like how could you keep your teams still enthusiastic and involved and engaged when every one of them is sitting in front of a screen in his home or home, yeah. it, it's really hard. Yeah. Um, and also, I think, there, of course, there are examples of, of, of very successful companies that have been working remotely since the start. For instance, the, um, the Todoist uh, company has, I think, people from 27 or 28 countries, and they have not, uh, in another sense, worked and always worked remotely. So there are, I think, um, areas or there are industries that, that work really well remotely. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, to a certain extent, healthcare uh, is, is, yeah, is not one of them. And you still have to bring yeah. people together. Yeah, yeah I, th I think that healthcare is one of the places that you see that um, the, the connection with humans is so important. You know, there are lots of like robots that they want to go to to take care of, of sick people or to go to people who are alone at home mm -hmm. or uh, some kind of AI talking to them. And, and sometimes it's it's maybe a bit better for them not being totally alone, but it cannot really replace a human being being next to you and talking yeah. to you or, yeah. or doing the, the thing. So I, I, think, I think that... Things that were very like obvious for us mm -hmm. is sometimes less obvious when they're taken away. So, so you feel it much more like 
powerfully. Yeah. Um, so, so could you tell us a use case from your experience? Uh, how did like open innovation solve a very big challenge or in hard times? Um, let me think. Um, I think one of the one of the yeah one of the use cases for open innovation, I think um, I think two or three years ago we did um, a, a combined project with another uh, a network in the region. Um, and it was a crossover between, healthcare and IT companies. And in that project, we had several workshops with, with IT companies um, uh, looking for um, uh, specific new products or, or combination of products that we could use in healthcare. And um, in doing that workshop, um, we came across a team that was um, led by two rather young people, I think mid-30s or something. And while we were working in, in that workshop, we, um, we, we figured out that they were actually the heirs of the company that their father had grounded. And, uh, and the fa mm -hmm. Their father was the founder of the company oh. that they were working for now. Um, mm -hmm. And they had both technical education. They were working as, as employees in the company. And the father passed away and they were moved from being a technical consultant in the company into the management of the company. Now they were owner slash, they were the, the, the team that had to take this company uh, into the future. And um, when, we, when we found that out during the workshop, that, that changed the whole workshop because we first we were just doing, yeah, let's say we were doing a business model canvas on how to bring in a new business model, whatever. Um, and now all of a sudden it became more of a personal thing on, okay, how can we help these people take their company to the next level? So there was a, there was a change in discussion and we, we more or less um, made it into a session. Okay. How, how can we bring this new challenge for these people and how can we, how can we discuss it and what can, what can other people in the room bring to this new uh, uh, a challenge that they're facing. Yeah. So from a rather, um, yeah, easy or very, very concrete problem, we came into a much more personal and a uh, whole other level. But um, it was interesting to use specific techniques um, of, of bringing different point of views um, different areas resetting their strategy yeah, okay let's let's go back to what did your father start this company for how do you perceive that vision now is that vision and mission changed how would you would like to reframe it if you uh, you know now what, what uh, with this new situation yeah. so it became a whole different um, workshop that we did not anticipate before but but using this more open innovation technique and, and, and flipping it around and looking from a different angle, it, it helped us. Um, it helped us help them bring that company to another level. So that yeah. was very, that was a very interesting workshop to do. Yeah. 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 So what you're saying is like the option to do it much more diverse and flexible is very important when you have open innovation because you take people from different perspective and different point of view and maybe even different way of thinking and they mm -hmm. are all together and thinking about it. And one more thing that I thought while you told this story is that we think about system or a company or a business and sometimes we are not focusing on the people who are, who are doing the business, right? Mm -hmm. Which are sometimes even more important and yeah. in, yeah. in this case the fact that they were like employees and then they it it turned to something else and yeah, made it changed, yeah it changed it changed the whole uh, um, afternoon or actually the two days that we were with them it, it changed it uh, completely um but yeah it's it's an interesting experience if if you're part of of something um, that you did not expect at that point, and then still you can use experience from from another career or another industry and and come to a solution. Which I think that is, yeah. Sometimes that's that's really amazing if that happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like um, 
although there are more uncertainties in open innovation, I think it, it, it has more potential in a sense and, 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 and more risks because it's... Yeah. Um, but um, I also feel that um, um, sometimes you have to uh, 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 more or less justify the visual tool set. Did you ever come across a customer that, and you would say, uh, for instance, uh, um, we like to do this, this visual workshop uh, type thing with a business model canvas and blah, blah, blah. And I, I sometimes get the reaction, oh, that's just sticky notes. Uh, yeah. On the board. Been there, yeah. done that, not doing it uh, tomorrow. Um, yeah. But what I find interesting is that um, although it seems playful and it seems like a game or it seems like something you do on a afternoon and you have a beer and whatever, um, I think the, the, st the structure underneath is very, um, it's, it's based on, yeah, maybe on, on psychology of bringing people together. And that underlay of helps, um, the good facilitator helps to get the group around the tool set and whatever tool set that is, it's, right. the, it's the facilitator and the energy that you put into the workshop that eventually brings the people on a certain level looking for a solution and um, maybe not even aware for themselves that they're bring that they're using their own experience and and history to to find a solution for a, for a common problem. Right. When people are asking me about that, I'm saying first that creativity needs needs the space for for to to, to be fruitful and and to be there because mm -hmm. it's cannot be it cannot live within structures. Creativity lives somewhere outside of the structure. And the second thing I would say that if you see these kinds of innovation um, uh, workshops you need to think about two aspects. One is like the business side, because we mm -hmm. want to find a solution and we're want to, we want to do something which is like finding the right solution for your business. Mm -hmm. And the second one is from the organization side. So how do people collaborate? How do you make people think differently within your organization? Maybe in this specific, specific uh, dilemma, it's maybe the challenge won't be that successful, but next time they'll know how to think and how to collaborate and how to co-create yeah. And the next time they could use these tool sets in order to do something different. So yeah. it's like two aspects of what they get. One is like very concrete. And then they say, ah, what, we, we got sticky notes because they see something very concrete. Mm -hmm. And the second one is like the way people think a, a mindset is something that you cannot see. It's not the sticky notes, right? Yeah. yeah. So this yeah, is, there's, there's a I think, I think there's a really good um, uh, tool set that, that, um, um, from IDEO, there's a there's a toolkit called Human Centered Design, and it very mm -hmm. much splits off into the practical side of of doing a, a visual workshop and the mindset that you need as the designer. And you're not being a designer, but you're using the mindset mm -hmm. of a designer to to come to that solution. Right. And for for people not that familiar with visual tool sets and design thinking and creative workshops, that's a very nice starting point to see that. Um, for instance, the creativity or the um, how, how many times have you not heard if you ask people to draw something that they say, oh, I cannot draw. But that's that's just um, it, it's not the it doesn't have to look nice, but making it making the translation of the image in your head into something on paper. That exercise yeah. itself will help you, well, literally visualize what the possible solution is that you're looking for. And, and then you could relate to it. So the, the power of what exactly. the designer has is to create something which is tangible and, and a focal point for the discussion for what we want to create. And we could agree or not agree on that, but once we yeah. see it, this yeah. is what the power of, of a designer would have. Yeah. As who comes from design, I always think that designer underestimate their powers because they think about what is the result they're creating and not what is the process of creation and creativity that they need, mm -hmm. which is very, very much uh, needed in, in business. We know yeah. that we need to be creative. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's, it's a good way of, of seeing what designers are doing, actually. Yeah. So what would be the most surprising thing you learned about innovation from your years of experience? Um... Well, it, it, it kind of um, 
connects to what I just said about about um, the enthusiasm and the and the energy you sometimes feel um, in the group. And um, one of the most surprising things is I think when when you have that workshop um, and and bring people together and then all of a sudden you find out that um, I distinctly remember a workshop where where I heard people talk to each other. They were working on a on a kind of a customer journey, um, and they literally said to each other, "We have been working together for for a number of years, but we actually have never sat in the same room talking about how we see our mutual process." They came from two different organizations, but they had to, in the in, literally in the patient journey, they had to work. Uh, next to each other in, in the steps of the whole process. So they were using telephone and email and fax and whatnot to communicate and work, and, but they were, never, um, they were never in the same room. So um, when I heard that, that, that was really something that I thought, thought, okay, by bringing people together in the same room and using these type of common language tool sets, that helps people Focalize what they are uh, uh, subconsciously not aware of, and then right. that tool set helps them to to come together in a in a mutual problem that they can solve together. Right. So they have the same language because they're using the same tool sets, and they have the agreement of what they're thinking. Sometimes they need to discuss it. It's not like they picture it and they, they all agree that this mm -hmm. is it. But the fact that they are discussing what could be or should be in this process and this solution, whatever, mm -hmm. is what we need to achieve. So that's yeah. what is more the organizational side and not the business side of, of doing uh, these kinds of workshops. Although innovation is, is, you know, like everybody knows about the workshop, which is like the fun part. Mm -hmm. But innovation is much, much harder work than just doing the peak of the of the fun part. It's yeah, it's it's, it's much more like doing things together and uh, thinking together in the sense of what could we do, what should we do, how could we do it, mm -hmm. and then really creating something together. It's not only thinking and strategy, it's like creating something together. And and if you bring the power of academia and the no knowledge they have in academia and the power of, of really executing from startups and maybe the the point of view of a government you could create something which is much more powerful if they were each one in his side so startups yeah. have their own advantages and disadvantages but they could merge together and think together which is yeah. i think it's kind of magic to think about it. like people are joining forces yeah, and, and and sometimes the magic ha happens in those workshops and you you come up with great solutions and great products and then they <laughs> Like you said, that's the fun part. And then the actual workshop, because then you have sure. to implement it and then you have to bring it into an organization that's not used to that, that way of working or not sure. used to that, that specific product. And yeah. then the hard work starts because then you have yeah. to deal with the real people uh, in the yeah. organization and, and all of a sudden all other types of energy uh, uh, yeah. start flowing. But Yeah, that's, that's the real challenge. Although yeah. if, if you involve these people like the the management who are who will be who might be more uh, reluctant to innovate all through the process you mm -hmm. make it a bit more easy for them to to be part of it and not just to take it from the like this is what we think now you should now you should do something with it and yeah. and yeah. it's it's a challenge although um getting people involved and and in some in one sense want to do things together. On the other side, sometimes organizations are not built to innovate and, and failure is not uh, it's something nobody wants to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on how, how, how expensive is it for you and your career you know, to do that. So it's, as a person yeah. who's doing that within a company, it's, it's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so when, when I'm asked about these workshops, I, I think it's like, you know, it's it's like the fun part, but if you want to really have fruits from from this fun part, you need to have all the hard work. It's it's like doing a diet, and then you you feel that yeah, now I'm thin, and then you have to save it all the time not to get fat again. So, <laughs> so yeah. the hard work is after the diet, not in the beginning. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 staying. Um... Yeah, it's staying lean, literally. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Right. Right. Yeah. So, what would be like number one tip you would give an innovation leader right now in this COVID crisis? Right now. 
Um, I think um, um, for innovation and for innovation leaders, I think it's um, essential in, in, in crisis, in, in any type of crisis maybe to, um, to stay agile uh, in a sense that you that you keep relying on the stuff that you know and that you that you have experienced. Um, so I think um, it's not so much. Um, I think the, the, um, I think an innovation leader or somebody in innovation needs to have different tool sets available, and we need to have a backpack of of different types of of ways of working. And this could be. Um, I, I, I'm still using stuff from my KPMG time, and I've uh, added some stuff that I learned in the hospital by doing uh, more more regulated type of project projects because they were regulated and they need to have specific uh, quality measures, etc. To now in a much more playful environment where I can mix and match different types of areas and different type of en uh, industries and experiences. Um, but I can I can put it all in in one package, and I can use different types of of tools and methods um, when I need it. And, when, and right. sometimes you also come across um, stuff that has been there. Also in innovation uh, uh, country, there have been ways of working that have always been there. I was really really amazed when I first saw a customer journey. And then I thought, this this is so familiar. Where have I seen this before? And then I thought, oh, wait a minute. At KPMG, we call it brown paper sessions. And we made oh. swimming lanes. And brown paper just came from this really large roll of, of brown paper, uh, yeah. wrapping paper. And yeah, we yeah. put it on the wall and we had the different departments so we you had uh, sales and inventory and and uh, manufacturing etc cetera, etc cetera. and they would draw swimming lanes and say okay customer comes in and he and then said oh yeah that's just now we call it the customer journey or patient journey yeah, yeah. still thinking okay what happens if a customer a patient or whatever person is engaging with our organization and what happens then and right. 25 years ago, we called it a brown paper session. Now we're calling it a patient journey or customer journey. But the, the tool set and the, the, the way of thinking is, is more or less still the same. It, it had some right. more colorful lines. It had maybe some more uh, emoticons in there. But uh, the, the basic idea was still the same. Right, right. So you're talking about the tools that you need in order to innovate. They need to be diverse and you need to see all points of view. And you have one is which is more like strict, I would say, more, more traditional maybe. Mm -hmm. And the second side is more like uh, open innovation, which is like more maybe more new. Mm -hmm. And I think that organizations which are more mature in their innovation would be more willing to try open innovation and maybe companies which are less uh, aware or used to doing innovation maybe they'll be more reluctant to use uh, these uncertain tools or like uh, advanced tools of, of open innovation maybe. Um, yeah, but I'd, I've also tried to explain sometimes to people not so familiar with, with the design thinking tool set that although it looks playful, I'm very convinced that um, trying to fail early actually de-risks your product and your your uh, your product and your project uh, portfolio because right. it, the sooner you get your customers and your patients and the actual end users of your idea or your product involved um, the sooner you know okay this is working or this is not working and then you can right by with really small steps you can come to a much better product in the end before you go to sure. market than the traditional way of oh we're building a new air fryer and we think the public will love it but we haven't actually asked the public if they're waiting for an air fryer um, yeah so yeah i agree i i totally agree i think that the way of thinking of uh how could we um make ourselves more resilient through failures is something that is like a, a bit contradicting how can we be resilient if we are failing but if we're failing fast and failing very early in the stage of of the process it's much 
yeah. less expensive than doing it in the end. And in yeah. the end, it's, it's so price, yeah. the price is so high. So, and if you translate that to healthcare, imagine how, what, what the impact is when you get the patient involved very early on, because it's, it, it is around the patient that you're trying to build the healthcare system. So imagine how expensive the failure is if you don't get the patient involved at the very beginning, because in the end, if you got it wrong, there's no more yeah. patient. More or less. Yeah, yeah, I see what so you're that's saying. So that's sure. why it's very, very, very essential that you, that you, well, I think in healthcare more and more, there are uh, uh, organizations for sure that are used, and it's not, not, not for nothing that there is a patient journey now, yeah, but yeah. that is really, um, really, I think, really essential and very, very good that the, that healthcare is is using these techniques to sure. get patients and the people that 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 that's concerning it and uh, the product or the, mm -hmm. the process get them involved very early. Sure, okay. sure. And once you understand them, you could build the right solution and the best solution, the optimal solution for them. And sometimes, you know, when we see it like more technically we might think it about it in a sense of what would be the best way for the doctor to do it or for the system to have it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we see the person, it's uh, the solution could be so much more um, human and maybe even simple in some cases, yeah. once you see their needs and their needs is not only like going through this procedure, they're doing more things when they're going to the doctor. So exactly. I think it's yeah. really important. Yeah. Okay. I really want to thank you for your time. If, if somebody wants to, to ask you something and get involved with Health Valley, how could they contact you? Oh, um, healthvalley.nl is the website. Um, me and my colleagues are all there with email addresses and telephone numbers. So we're, you can find us very, very easily. Yeah. Sure, sure. So I want to thank you for your time again, and it's been a pleasure. I am sure that lots of people find this interesting and and and, and insightful when they think about what you're saying. And and because it's really important, as I see it right now, doing innovation within crisis. So, mm -hmm. um, I think it, it it's it's very like uh, valuable for people. Okay. Well, so, glad to be uh, be on your show. It was very. Uh, very nice chat. So yeah, thank you. Thank very much. you. So okay. have a great day. See you. See you again, and I'd be happy to talk again and see what can we do together. All right. So thank you. Have a great day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Yeah. Hi, Madima Zoukario, and you've been listening to the Invincible Innovation Podcast. Make sure to visit our website, invincibleinnovation.com where you can learn more about our programs and my book, Innovating Through Chaos. I'll be waiting for you next week in our next episode. Thank you for listening.